I want to talk today about uh, quantitative trait analysis in inbred line crosses. Let me say that a quantitative trait is anything that you can measure. Uh, it might, for example, be blood pressure or body weight. It might even be diabetes, which you might think of as a disease that's a yes or a no. Uh, a mouse, in this case, may have diabetes or not have diabetes, and that's a measurable trait. Uh, sometimes we would encode that as a zero or a one, which makes it a quantitative trait. So even though it's discrete in a sense, it is a quantitative trait. However, when we think of quantitative traits, we think of generally things that have a continuous scale of measurement. In fact, if we were interested in diabetes, it might be more informative to measure the glucose level. Uh, the definition of diabetes in a mouse, at least, is that the uh, fasting glucose level is above 250 micrograms per deciliter. And the glucose level is a continuous measurement, and it tends to be much more informative and more tractable for analysis than a simple yes-no trait. So we're going to be thinking about quantitative traits, and we study these quantitative traits in the mice for a number of reasons. Let me say that we are primarily interested in, in human disease and understanding uh, how and why uh, humans are susceptible to obesity and diabetes. But the mice serve as a model for us that we can use in an experimental setting. Let me introduce you to some mice. Uh, these are mice. In fact, these are inbred mice. I'd, I'd ask you to take a good look at them and, and um, tell me what you notice about them. They're albino. Yes, they're all white. In fact, all five of them are white. Um, in fact, all five of them look alike. I don't know if you're accustomed to seeing mice, but you should notice that these mice are not only all white, they're all strikingly similar. Uh, these are all mice from an inbred strain called SJL, and they look cute and fuzzy, which is one of the responses I was anticipating, but um, beware, they will bite you. Uh, these are not friendly mice. They're all genetically identical. And the way that they became genetically identical is they've been maintained in the laboratory setting uh, for many years, and they're maintained generation after generation by mating a brother with a sister. Now, the Egyptians tried that a long time ago, and it didn't really work well for their pharaohs, but um, for the mice, we've been able to achieve uh, fully inbred uh, strains, they're called, and although this is a bit of an unusual genetic situation, it's one that we can use to, to great advantage. So after about 20 generations of brother-sister mating, over time the two chromosomes, the one inherited from the mother and the one inherited from the father in each individual, become more and more alike. The differences get sorted out and over time the two chromosomes become absolutely identical so that as new brother and sister generations are mated to produce offspring, these offspring are all genetically identical to one another again and to their parents, and so they're reproducible. This means that we can make the same mouse over and over and over again. One advantage of that is, for example, you might be interested in whether diet has an effect on susceptibility to diabetes. And in humans, you could in principle do a twin study where you gave one diet to one twin and another diet to another twin but with mice we could take dozens of mice all of the same strain and put some of them on one diet and some of them on the other and in this way we could understand the effects of diet independently of the genetics. In fact um, one of the most important reasons for studying any kind of model, but an animal model or a mouse model, is that we have uh, exquisite control over the conditions in which the animal exists. And because we have inbred lines, as I'll show you a little bit of today, we have really exquisite control over the genetics too. Uh, these are things that would be impractical if not immoral uh, to carry on with humans, um, not necessarily harmful to the mouse, but brother-sister mating, for example, would be frowned upon in a human study. Uh, we can control the food they eat, the cages they live in, everything about the environment. 
Uh, we can control and intervene in the physiology of the mouse, um, whether we're um, uh, manipulating it in some way. We can control the genetics uh, by breeding. And because we can do that, we can, in the end of the day, infer uh, causal relationships. Causal relationships are extremely critical to science and we'll come back to them again and again throughout the semester. But I want you to understand that one reason we study mice is because of this ability to understand causality. Uh, there are two broad approaches that one takes in genetic studies. The names really seem backwards to me, but one is called reverse genetics and the other is called forward genetics. In reverse genetics, we start with the gene. And because of uh, techniques of uh, using embryonic stem cells and genetic engineering, which has been perfected in the mouse, uh, we can actually essentially reach into the genome of the mouse and alter any gene in any way that we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we can remove it. That's called a knockout. Uh, we can make it turn on and off under specific conditions in response to um, stimulus. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the glowing green mouse. Uh, this is quite a, a popular way to, um, to manipulate the genomes of mice. So we can actually go in and alter the function of a gene. And I'll tell you that when you alter the function of a gene, and then you look at what happens to the mouse, uh, in many cases nothing happens at all, uh, at least nothing obvious to you, but it may be obvious to other mice. Uh, but when things do respond to manipulations of the genome, it tends to affect many phenotypes. The, the point being that one gene can affect many phenotypes. Phenotypes are just anything that you can observe about the mouse, whether it's the coat color, the body weight, the blood pressure, behavior. One gene does not map onto one phenotype. Typically, changing a gene affects many phenotypes, and this is called pleiotropy. We can see that when we do reverse genetics. When we do forward genetics, we start from the other end. We start from a phenotype. We might be interested, for example, in blood pressure. And starting from the phenotype in ways that I will describe in some detail today, we can work our way back to the genes. We can understand where in the genome the different variants in the DNA come from that cause variation in the phenotype. So if some mice have high blood pressure and some mice have low blood pressure and there's a genetic reason for that, somewhere in the DNA there are differences between those mice and we want to identify where those differences are and associate them with genes. What happens when we do that is we often find for any given phenotype we find more than one gene. So it's really the same story. There's not one gene for one phenotype. When we see that a phenotype is affected by many genes we call this heterogeneity. And I want you to think about forward genetics and reverse genetics for a moment and overlay the two and just imagine that there's a map between many thousands of genes and many thousands of phenotypes that essentially is a spider web between the two. Mm -hmm. And our job is to understand, if not the whole spider web, at least little aspects of it. How do we get from variation in the DNA, the genetic material, to phenotypes that we uh, can express, things that we're interested in, um, things like disease phenotypes. The whole thing is a pretty complex web, and that's why sometimes quantitative trait analysis is called complex trait analysis mm -hmm. because when you get right down to it it gets pretty complex mm -hmm. and pretty messy. We're not going to talk much about reverse genetics. I, I need you to be aware of it. I need you to um, be prepared to perhaps later in the semester suggest ideas that use reverse genetics to ask a specific question. But today and uh, for the next several weeks we are all about forward genetics. Mm -hmm. And let me explain how that's done with inbred lines. This is a diagram that uh, illustrates a single chromosome as it segregates through a particular mating scheme called a back cross. P1 and P2 are two different inbred lines. I've colored their chromosomes here black and gray, and the idea in the inbred line is that the two chromosomes, the maternally inherited and the, and the paternally inherited chromosome, are essentially identical. 
And so in the P1 I've colored them both black and in the P2 I've colored them both gray. If we mate parent 1 with parent 2, we get an individual or a set of progeny called the filial 1 generation, the F1. Every F1 animal inherits a paternal chromosome and a maternal chromosome, and you can see I've drawn the F1 animals as having one black and one gray chromosome. It's interesting that even though um, there may be many differences between parent 1 and parent 2. The F1 animals are all genetically identical because they have one copy of each of those differences. Those copies are called alleles. In this case, if there were a difference between the P1 and P2 genomes, the filial 1 animal would have a black allele and a gray allele, and we call that heterozygous. So everywhere that, um, that the P1 and the P2 differ, the F1 is a heterozygote. We can take the F1 and cross it back to P1. You can begin to understand why these genetic experiments aren't really viable in many organisms, and humans in particular. It doesn't have to be exactly the same P1. Uh, because P1 is an inbred strain and we can make more and more of them all the time. So we're not necessarily uh, mating an offspring back to its mother, uh, but we have another female animal from the P1 strain that we can mate to an F1. And in this diagram I'm showing you uh, their offspring, four examples of what might arise from a mating like this, and this is called the back cross one generation. Everybody in the back cross one generation has inherited a black chromosome from P1, but the chromosome inherited from F1 does something special. When the gametes are formed, the chromosomes pair together and they exchange parts. Sometimes you get a chromosome that's solid gray and sometimes one that's solid black, but most of the time the chromosomes exchange little bits and we get chromosomes that are mosaics. Because of this, every animal in the BC1 generation is unique. They're not like inbred lines. We can't reproduce them. Everybody's different and everybody has a different genome. And as a result, if there are variants in the genome that affect a trait, everybody has different phenotype as well. I'm going to think about blood pressure as an example throughout this talk, and I'm going to imagine for a moment that in this back cross one generation, at the very bottom of that cartoon chromosome, that there is a gene that has two alleles that affect blood pressure. And if the gray allele causes the blood pressure to be lower, then you might expect the first individual to have low, the second individual to have low, the third individual to have high, and the fourth individual to have low blood pressure. Mm -hmm. In this way, in a cartoon example, you can see how the back cross one generation can cause blood pressure to segregate together with a genetic variant, and we might be able to figure out where in the genome the genes are that uh, are affecting the blood pressure. So that's a back cross, and I'm not going to, to do it in, in as depth, much depth, but this is an intercross. An intercross is a very similar idea. Uh, an intercross, you can think of this as two for the price of one. Uh, we're going to take parent one and parent two, just like before, and create F1. But now we're going to mate two F1 animals together, and in this cross, both chromosomes can be recombinant. The maternal chromosome and the paternal chromosome can both be mixtures of gray and black. And I want you to look at the four F2 individuals. Notice that both chromosomes are potentially recombinant. And think about that blood pressure allele at the very bottom of the chromosome. In the first individual, there are two gray copies and I must have said low. So this animal would have extra low blood pressure. The, uh, the next animal would be a heterozygote and it may have medium blood pressure and the two individuals, uh, last two individuals are homozygous for the black allele and they would have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So again you can see how blood pressure might be associated with genotype. In the F2, I want you to notice that there are three possible genotypes. You can be homozygous P1, heterozygous, or homozygous P2. Different from the back cross where you're either heterozygote or a homozygote for P1. So 
So that's an inner cross and a back cross. And these are the kinds of mouse populations that we're going to look at. I don't want to digress and tell you about all the imaginative, creative ways that you can create mouse crosses. I'd be glad to in a later class. Uh, it's become a specialty of mine mm -hmm. to, to create new ways to cross mice. But these, mm -hmm. are the, these are the workhorses of genetics, the intercross and the backcross.